you're here because you some way somehow you've been touched <laughs> by the lit review. In a good way or a bad way, you either are facing a lit review, you're in the middle of writing a lit review, you want to get prepared to write a lit review, you didn't think you were going to be writing a lit review this early, but your professor, as a graduate research assistant, you have to write a lit review. So that's kind of where we are and how we're going to get started here today. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of the things that you probably have already read about a lit review in terms of what it does, what it is, what the purpose is, and so forth. That's kind of general information. But then I have a strategy that, that I think would be, will be pretty practical, I hope, and, and show you, okay, well, well, yeah, I know what it is, and I know what I'm supposed to do, but how do I do it? And then how do, when I get all these sources, how do I organize them? And then how do I actually write the darn thing? Because I think that that's where there's a lot of information that's missing. Um, your professors can tell you, we'll do this, do this, do this in very general terms, but, but I'm gonna hopefully we'll get down into the, into the dirt of it, get our hands dirty and actually say, well, well how do I, what verbs do I use? How do I put these two sources together? Okay. I'm going to tell you that I really didn't make up any of this on my own. I'd love to take all full credit for it, but actually what I did was I did two things. There is a wonderful book called They Say, I Say, okay? uh, The Moves That Matter in Academic Writing. And it talks about how to use source material in your writing. It's actually directed at undergraduates, but I think it's so helpful and so practical that it's a book. It's like a, you know, about that thin. It's not big and it's not little print or anything like that. But it even gives you a list of verbs that may be helpful in terms of saying, okay, scholar X sets. And we're going to go through some of these in the presentation as well. Then. I found that a lot of times the examples that they give in this book are not helpful to graduate students because they're not in-depth enough. And also, I had a hard time finding examples as well. So I found a literature review that's uh, in economics, which is not my field, which I found would be really better to pick a, a lit review that wasn't in my field at all and show you how it could work in any field. Okay, so what I did is I took almost all of the examples from this article, Socioeconomic Conditions of Property Crime. So those, what I've done is I've taken this stuff and this stuff and just put it together. Okay, well, let's just cover the basics just to get started. What's a lit review? Well, and that's a good question because you may be doing a couple of different um, uh, lit reviews. There are actually two kinds of lit reviews, but basically it's a comprehensive examination of all of the research and all the literature done on a particular topic. That's obvious. You guys probably already know that. Okay? But there are two categories of literature reviews, and I want to break it down because I'm really going to focus more on one category over the other. Uh, there are two categories. One is a literature review that contextualizes a research study. And for probably 90% of you, and I'm spitballing the statistic here, but for about 90% of you, that's what you're doing. You're, you're doing a study. You're doing a research study okay, in your dissertation, your thesis, whatever. Okay? Or your professor is doing a study, you know, empirical research or whatever. You're, you are then doing the literature review that justifies the study, correct? Okay. If it's a journal article, if it's uh, the, and you're doing the research, if it's a, a dissertation, if it's a thesis, that's what you're doing. There is one other kind of literature review, though, and I think it's important to like just touch on it. Okay. And that is a literature review that is a study in and of itself. Okay. You can actually publish a journal article that is a in and of itself a literature review. All right. So for example, if there's a topic that's very mature and there's a lot of literature written on it and it would advance knowledge in the field to do a literature review on it, that would be helpful. There's also a literature review where there, uh, it's a new or emerging topic and it would be helpful to gather all of the literature on this new or emerging topic. That's suitable as well. The other, the other part that I that is like uh, helpful too is I've seen some literature reviews that um, combine if if there's a topic that's interdisciplinary and nobody's looked at the interdisciplinary part of it they bring in multiple disciplines on the literature review and advance the knowledge that way that second one is not really what we're going to talk about today but the concepts will apply but most of you guys are in the boat where you have to write a, a, a lit review for your dissertation, your thesis, or a journal article. Okay? All right. So let's, kinda, let's go move on to the next step. 
What, what's the reason? What, why would you write a literature review? Well, uh, my professor told me it was part of my dissertation. It's a, it's a chapter in my dissertation. But what is it for? One, it establishes what is already known about a particular topic. And two, what methods have been used to research that topic. Okay? And then also, when you're doing your research, if you don't do a literature review first, how do you know you're not duplicating what somebody else has already done? That's bad. You know, because then you go to your chair and you go, here it is. This is the last six months of my life's work. And they go, yeah, but Smith did that three years ago. Smith and, you know, Smith and Wesson did a study, you know, that's very similar to yours and, you know, and start over, right? So you don't want to get in that bind. You want to do your literature review. It's a matter of front-end loading versus back-end loading your work. You want to front-end load your work. You don't want to re reproduce what somebody else has done. Unless you're reproducing a study that somebody else has done. A lot of times you use the same methodology and so forth and you get different results. In the sciences, I think this is done. But you still don't want exactly the same thing to happen because then you're just replicating, okay? It also exposes gaps in literature and helps you position your research. In your dissertation or your thesis, you're supposed to come up with something new, right? Okay, well how do you know what's new? How do you know what's new? Um, at the uh, one of the last slides I'm going to show you is then how to find the gaps in the research because I think that that's a little difficult. Okay. I've done several literature reviews um, and, and these are the questions that I ask myself and these are the questions that people ask me. I think the big question is how much literature do I need to look at? I could spend probably the next five years of my life looking at the literature in this field and that's depressing. You know? So how much? What related ideas do I need to explore? Subtopics or overarching ideas? A lot of times you're looking at a topic, but that topic has subtopics, correct? Or that subtopic has overarching topics. How do I know, okay? How do I know that I need to go to related ideas? Well, you need to just start swimming in the literature and figure it out. But let me, let me give you an example from my latest lit review. So. I'm looking at plagiarism, okay, the, you know, just the concept plagiarism. But what I really started with was uh, academic dishonesty. And I realized that that was too big a topic. And I got myself in the literature and I got myself just in, in a real uh, tangle because there was so much literature on it. I go, well, how am I going to write about everything? I can't. Okay, is there, is there a bigger topic that I need to, to look at? Or is there a subtopic that I need to look at? And one of the things we were talking about before, before this started was the idea that, that you're trying to decide on your dissertation topic and then you need to do your literature review. You may swap that. You may go ahead and start the literature review and then expose a gap in the literature and then find your dissertation topic. That's what happened to me and it was really helpful. Is there a certain literature that provides a better couch for your study than others? And that's how you can also discriminate whether you're going to use a piece of literature in, in your l literature review. Okay, and, and a related uh, question that may be a duplicate question but more practical for you is why use a particular instrument for my study or why use a particular methodology for my study, okay? In the hard sciences, you're, if you're looking at laminitis, which is really fascinating to me, if you're looking at laminitis, scientists have been looking at this for a long time. Have they been looking in a different way at the problem than you're looking at it? He's using a new method or approach. So, why use a different method? Because the other methods haven't worked. See what I'm saying? You only know that when you look at the literature, though. What's been done before to tackle my particular research topic or problem? The next step is finding the literature. That would be good. You know, some of you have found too much literature. We'll deal with that in a few, a few slides. But finding literature, how do you know you can find? One of the things that I think, I'm, I'm going to show you the details of every, every one of these suggestions, but one of the things that I think is sorely underutilized is your subject specialist reference librarian. When I talk to the reference librarians and the subject specialist librarians, they go, we just want people to come see us. We love to work with people. And so they're like waiting for you. They're wait, you know, their arms outstretched. Let me help you. Okay, so take advantage of that. It's free. Okay. The other thing that I think is, is helpful is how do you find then also then good sources? I, I swim through those databases, the library databases, and I'm completely overwhelmed. How many of you guys find that to be true? 
I look in there and I do like a search, a, a topical search, and I get 18,000 hits. And, and I go through and I go, well, how, how do I even know that this is a good source? How do I even know that this is something that will be helpful to me? Because one of the things in your literature reviews, you, the question you ask, how much literature do I need to look at? You're not going to be able to look at all the literature if you have a big topic, correct? So how do you know, who are the, who are the scholars that you really need to cite? And how would you do that? Really, you want the big players. You don't need to mess with the little guys. You want the big scholars, the big players in your field, correct? I don't know about you guys, but when I first research a topic, I don't know who the big players are. Do you? I don't know who the big players are. Ah, but Google does. If you go to scholar.google.com, it is not comprehensive. Your databases, your library databases are a lot more comprehensive than this. But as a starting point, these articles come up, these books come up, and right here it says cited by, and there's a number. This says cited by 45, so that's 45 other scholarly sources cited that source. So if you're overwhelmed with the amount of literature you're looking at, you won't only want to find the big players in the field, right? So if it says cited by two, which that would be my journal article, right? You may not want to mess with it. But if it says cited by, you know, 60, cited by 200, right? Then you go, ah, maybe this person is somebody that people are talking to and talking about. And all you're doing is you're tapping into the conversation and you're trying to find a place for you to join the conversation. You're trying to find a little hole for you to fit into, all right? This is a real quick and dirty way of finding the sources very quickly. Once you're very familiar with the big name players in your field, the people who are talking the most, the most respected, the most controversial, whatever, whatever you're actually looking for, then go back to the library database. Then you can do your searches. Your searches then can be much more refined because maybe you just want to find all the articles from Donald McKay because he's the biggest player in academic dishonesty research that you can find. Then you're going to find related articles to that article. See? See how it all kind of webs together? You can find dissertations written on your topic from your department from Texas A&M. Just like that. Okay. Why is this helpful? I wanted to find out. I wanted to read dissertations supervised by my chair and other members of my committee. Now that's, that's, that's a little bit outside the literature review, but do you understand why I might want to do that? I want to know what they're going to be looking for, what they've signed off on, <coughs> that kind of thing. I also want to know what a dissertation in my department looks like. Okay? Now, you know, um, there are all kinds of methodologies you may be using. You may find, you may go ahead and look for a dissertation or a thesis with even the methodology and so forth. There's a lot of things. But at the very minimum, to, to bring it back to the topic we're talking about today, you could look at a dissertation from your department and your field and look at the literature review and see what it looks like. Particularly those where your chair or your committee members have supervised those other students See what it looks like. See what your committee members are going to expect. Because let's be honest, you guys. You know, y y your committee members sign the paperwork, correct? Right? They do. And, and, and you want to be in line with their expectations. Okay? All right. So what you do here is you just go to the library, just the home page. You pick up the database one. It says search for databases and it says ProQuest dissertation. So you can look for school, Texas A&M University. You can look for the terms in the abstract or you can actually look for the terms used in the document text. So, you know, your topic in, did anybody at Texas A&M in my department or whatever at Texas A&M write a, write a dissertation with this topic used in the, in the text? 
I think that this is a astronomically helpful and a lot of people don't know about it. Um, and it's a way to do your homework before you do your homework. Okay? All right. Where are we now? We know we have to do a lit review. We've gone to the library databases, we've looked at the subject librarians. We actually now have stacks and stacks and stacks of printed PDF files in our house, in our car, in the back seat. How do you wade through all of that stuff? Especially if you have a lot of it. Okay. Okay, so the deal is you want to find out what scholars are saying about your topic. And we already know how to find the good ones, how the big players, Google Scholar. What are the ongoing debates or conversations on your topic? Okay. Is anybody talking about your topic at all? Okay. And if they aren't, why? And that's something to think about in terms of making choices. All right. If people are talking, Who's talking and what are they talking about? This also helps you organize your information. You have a copious amount of information when you're doing your literature review. You have lots of information. And Brandy and I were talking about this earlier, that we gathered all the information, then we took a break from the literature review. And when we went back, we had no, Id we had no idea where to start again because we had forgotten everything that was in every article. We didn't really forget, but we kind of did because you almost have to be concentrating on that topic intently. You have to be thinking about it and thinking about it. And you go, OK, well, what does so-and-so say? What does so-and-so say? What does so-and-so say? Okay. So what are the ongoing debates within your topic? And it may be, if you're in the hard sciences, it may be about methodology. Why does this methodology work better than this methodology? Well, this study was done, but it didn't do any good. And if you're in education, there's a lot of theories in education. You education people, I saw about half of you guys were education. Education, they love theories. Well, the theory is this. Well, this theory may not be adequate, right? Is this theory work? Theory, 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 right? Okay. What ideas do you agree with? Oh my gosh, this, this guy just has all the answers. You know, this is perfect. Uh, whatever I do, he gets it and, or she gets it and I'm gonna follow that. And hopefully, once you do a lot of reading, you go, oh no. No, 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 no. That would never work. I can see why they haven't solved the problem because they're not looking at it in the right way. Correct? And then this is probably the most important question if you're looking to the literature. What hasn't been said about your topic? Because really what you're trying to do is you're trying to find your little niche. What are you going to write about? What are you going to study? Okay? You don't want to say something that's been replicated. Organizing the writing of your literature review is probably the most difficult thing that you're going to tackle, I think. You know, I've got all these articles and I've read them all and I don't know where to start. Okay? I have a couple of suggestions. You probably have a good sense of where the conversation is. You know, you've done all this work, you've done all the reading. You probably have a sense that this, this scholar doesn't agree with this scholar, and this researcher used this methodology, but didn't accomplish what, what you think could be accomplished with this methodology. Okay? Or maybe it's been looked at in this way, but not this way, and you think that that would really solve the problem, because somebody else looked at something this way. I was helping a, a, a student with her thesis, and <coughs> she is uh, doing a study of, um, uh, what's called bull switching in, uh, in a water buck herd. Basically, they bring in a male for breeding season. They only want one breeding season to, to help with the health of the, the, the uh, water bucks and the, and, the, and the survival of the calves. So what they do, though, to keep the herd intact is they take that, they take the bull, bring him in to the to this breeding season, then remove the bull and bring in a vasectomized male for these water bucks. Okay? Well, she had to do two things. She had to research bull switching in, in other species because it, be, because it had been, never been done in the water buck species. And she was observing the animals in a semi-natural environment as opposed to the wild, as opposed to a zoo. She was looking at it at Fossil Rim uh, Park and that's a semi-natural environment where they don't want to interfere with the natural wildlife, but they do some interference, right? 
She found no literature on, you know, bull switching and water bucks. She found no literature in bull switching in semi-natural environments. She found no literature, you know what I mean? Can you keep going? This is really great research that she's doing. But doing the literature review was very, very difficult because what she had to do was pull from other areas and say, okay, what work has been done on animals in semi-natural environments? Pull that in. Seems almost unrelated, doesn't it? But she had to do it because there was nothing in her field. What about breeding? What about breeding in semi-natural environments? You know, so she had to look at all of these things. Once she got that together, though, she said, well, how do I talk about it? All right. Her problem is probably not your problem. Her problem is that she didn't. Ha she had to really do her st a stretch on the lit review. For most of you guys, you're going to have too much literature on your topic. So how do you organize it? Well, one of the ways you can organize your lit review, and you're going to have a little overlap, but one is to look at the material sequentially. What happened first? What happened second? What happened her third? In Ed Psych, sometimes this is helpful because you go, well, they used to think you know, researchers did this experiment and they used to think that students did this in this way. But now, research shows, because it's very current, you know, you're always looking at the current stuff, the new stuff, S research shows now that this works better, okay? So sequential is not a bad way to go because you look back at what's done before. It won't be all of your lit review though, you know, and it may not be applicable to your lit review at all. Sequence may not matter, okay? What may matter is topics. So you look at your topics and your subtopics and you go topical, okay? Maybe you want to talk about research in semi-natural environments. Um, bull switching in semi-natural environments. So you're looking at all of your subtopics so that it makes sense when you get to the end that your reader understands why you're doing the research you're doing. Okay, topical. You're going to do some topical no matter what. Methodological. No other strategy has worked. They've tried this, they've tried this, they've tried this. They've tried looking at it quantitatively. They've done bootstrap analysis. They've done regression. They've done qualitative studies. They've done this, they've done this, they've done all kinds of this. Nothing works, but my method will. See? You're setting it up. Okay. And theoretical. This is mostly for the education people and the social sciences. Theory, theory, theory. This theory, this theory, this theory, this theory, this theory. I don't think that you're going to use one or the other. I think you're going to use a mixture of maybe all four of those, but it's a way to get started. So let's get rid of all of the stuff. Okay, you've got PDFs everywhere and you know what they say, but you're kind of confusing. You. Okay, so I've got three articles that talk about this subtopic. Put them, put them down, put them over here. I've got three articles that talk about this topic. I've got four articles that talk about this topic. And I have one article that debunks all of those articles. So then you have something to write about. You can r write at least a couple of pages. And you guys, you don't have to write the lit review in one day. If you try to do that, you will, oh, I, won't, I don't know what you'll do. Take it little bitty steps at a time. See what you can do in one sitting and then move on and then move on and then move on. Think about, okay, what do they say? What do they say? This is what we're going to do. This is where that they say, I say comes in. What do they say, the scholars? How do I agree or disagree with them? Okay. What do they, okay, what do experts in the field say about X? You could say the results of Hester, the result of Hester's study contradict the findings of Smith. What are commonplace opinions on X? Most experts believe that the stock market will continue to weaken over the next six months. What do others, what do scholars imply or assume? Some Title IX opponents assume that most young women simply do not want to play sports at the collegiate level. This is from a lit review that I did for a journal article. And then what I said was, they assume it, but it's not true because of the methods they use to research, you know, okay? What are both sides of the argument? Well, this, this scholar says this, and the scholar says this. That's where you start, you guys. That's where you start your literature review. Don't think of anything else but that at this particular point. What do they say? Okay. Now, I didn't put any citations in here. Of course, you're going to cite your sources. I'm going to show you. This is from the economics piece. Here's an example from a real journal article, a real lit review, 
that starts with one of those standard statements and then leads to placing that statement into the larger conversation. And it says, economists generally associate an individual's absolute poverty, and I left out some of the stuff, to the individual's expected benefits of legal and illegal activity. Therefore, absolute poverty may create the perception that one's skills are relatively more productive in criminal activity. That's the general statement. Look at the transition then. In addition, now all I've done is, you know, you make a general statement. This is what most of the scholars, this is like standard thought in the field. Now I'm getting into my lit review and I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to add a detail to that general statement. And I'm going to use lot. In addition, Lott postulates that the poor are more likely to engage in criminal activity, yada, yada, yada. And what am I doing here? Basically, I'm then shifting. I'm saying, OK, this scholar is saying this. You're looking now at both sides of the topic, or all sides of the topic. And you're saying, OK, this is the general thought about this. This is what this scholar says about this. But this scholar says this, okay? Easy, just using transition words, general statement leading to, now you've got two sources out of the way, right? You only have about 50 or 60 to go, right? No big deal, I'm just kidding. Now, what you can do is, now what I'm doing is, however, and this is, I've randomly excerpt, excerpted these from the article, so it, don't feel like you don't understand the article because we're not going in order at all, okay? Uh, the author of this lit review says this, 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 stop. In contrast, I'm switching directions here, in contrast to these views, other researchers hypothesize that community and family structure are linked to property crime only if they're associated with relative poverty. General statement, correct? For example, now I get to use a source again. A literature review is not an annotated bibliography. Because annotated bibliographies do not position the literature. Okay? They just state what the literature says. Your job in literature review is to position the literature and show that you understand the conversation. Okay? That's the difference. That's a really good question. Actually, doing an annotated bibliography is not a bad way to start your literature review. It is a way to stay organized. But the annotated bibliography would be the first step in gathering the information and summarizing it. Then the next step would be placing it within the conversation. Okay? Meta-analysis uh, has a different meaning in the sciences in terms of like, really you're talking about a lot of studies and then doing a statistical analysis. But what I mean here is just looking at all of the literature, what of all of those sources, they all basically say the same thing or they've tackled the same topic in the same way. This is from the economics article. Here's the statement. Empirical results from crime studies generally support a positive relationship between absolute poverty or relative poverty and property crime rates. Now, what he has done in this article is all of the sources that this, scholar, this, this author has cited here, they all have empirical studies. They've all written articles. on. They've all done empirical studies that result, you know, the, the conclusion is that there is a positive relationship between absolute poverty and property crime rates, okay? So when you say how much literature should I have, if all of these people have done the same study or similar studies and they've drawn the same conclusion, this is how you cite it. However, Empirical support for significant positive effects is not universal. Not every scholar or researcher has found this to be true. Gillespie evidently did not. Either that or Gillespie is countering this argument in, 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 the, in, in you know, Gillespie's uh, research. So once you get the breadth and once you've done the annotated bibliography, you can see this pretty easy. You know, it's going to come together for you after that. How then to attribute the sources? Now, all of you from very different areas. Uh, some of you are going to use IEEE, that's an engineering style guide. Some of you guys may be using uh, MLA, APA. Some of you will just be using a journal article and basing your citation style on that journal article. So I can't make any given statements about exactly how to cite your work. 
the piece that I'm using is using APA. The piece is from economics, social sciences, so that works, okay? And sociology. But what I can tell you is when you're using source material, there are two ways of attributing the source. And I think this gets to your question. One, you either use the scholar's name in the text or you use the scholar's name in the citation, one or the other. Those are two choices, pretty easy, okay? My first one says scholar X, and now here's a list of verbs you could even use. Scholar X acknowledges, agrees, argues, believes, claims, concedes, demonstrates, disagrees. That's a whole list of verbs. You can use any of those. They're free, pick them, use them, no big deal. That's used in social sciences more because if you're talking about theories, there will be a, a person or a scholar associated with that theory. Does that make sense? If you're in the hard sciences, a lot of times that is gonna come in the next one, attributing sources within the citation. Transformational learning, although that's not the example I used, but transformational learning creates an opportunity for learners to experience a life-changing moment which will alter their worldview, Smith, 1997. A lot of times when you're talking about sciences, you're talking about this methodology was used in this research, yada, 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 maybe using the passive voice even, I don't know, and then you'll, you'll put the citation at the end. Um, some of you guys use the numerical citations, the science citations where you use a one, two, three, and then you just go back to the one every time you re refer to that source. There are all kinds of ways to cite materials, but there are really only two ways to attribute, in the text or in the citation, one or the other. Yeah, this, that's a really good question. What I think is, you're going to need to use common sense because what's most important is that the reader understands where that information comes from. So if you have a paragraph and it's coming from three different sources, if it's a meta-analysis, they're all saying the same thing, they all have the same results, you can put it at the end, right? But if you're mixing it up and you're talking about this idea or this result, and then you're going to another one, put the citation right after the sentence. Then go on to the next idea, put the citation right after the sentence, and then so on. Because what's really important is you don't want to deceive the reader regarding where that information came from. It can really mess you up. Like I said, if it's a meta-analysis, you can wait till the end. If it's one source and one paragraph, it seems usually it's pretty clear that all that information came from the same source. You can usually go wait, ahead and wait for it at the end. If you're in the social sciences, what I do, just to make it really clear in education, social sciences, humanities, history, those kinds of topics, I then say scholar X says yada, 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 okay? If you're in the hard sciences, you may not be using scholars' names to be referring to your literature. Then you're going to want to wait till, till the end. But I want to make it clear to my reader that this is so-and-so's theory, okay? If you use quotations, a lot of you guys won't be using quotations, but if you do use quotations, here are some really easy way for entering, uh, uh, just attributing your, your quotations, okay? Scholar X states, says, writes, complains, and then the example is yada yada, and then scholar Y disagrees saying hama hama. You can also go back to that list of verbs and just put any of those verbs in there that are appropriate. You Definitely don't want to throw a quotation out there uh, and let the reader interpret it. It's not the reader's, the burden of proof, the burden of explaining the quotation is on the writer, not the reader. So you go, this is a really cool quote. It says everything I wanted to say. It's so important. I have to use it. It's brilliant, okay? After you say it or before you say it, you're going to want to explain it. Well, you know, this is a lot of information. A lot. How do I guide my reader through all of this information? Because it's pretty easy to throw the literature in here, but it's really difficult to make your reader understand the way it goes. You need a road map, right? Like that's what we were talking about, the however. Now I'm turning directions in contrast. In addition, I'm going the same direction. However, I'm changing directions. Therefore, I'm drawing a conclusion. See what I'm saying? You gotta guide your reader, okay? Because your if your reader gets lost and your reader is your chair, you're starting over. So, I have three ways of doing this when I write, okay? 
and I, and I think these are they're pretty helpful. You, you can use pointing words. First of all, you want your topics to flow together. But that's why we're talking about sequential, methodolog methodological, and those kinds of things. Now we're getting down to the sentence level stuff rather than the paragraph level stuff or the page level stuff. Now we're getting to down to the sentence level stuff. Pointing words, transitions, and conjunctive adverbs. Using pointing words. Pointing words refer back to a concept you discussed in the previous sentence. You want your reader to know that you're really still talking about the same idea. But you want to avoid ambiguity. Sometimes if you use the word this, these, your reader doesn't know what this is referring to. If you use it alone, it should be absolutely clear what idea your pronoun is referring to. You can name the pointer as follows to avoid confusion. So if you're talking about the debate between scholars on this topic, you could say, this led to yada, yada, yada. But if this is not clear what it refers to, you could say, this debate, this argument, this uh, methodolog methodological process, you know, whatever you're talking about in the previous sentence, use a pointer to carry your reader in that direction, okay? This debate is not settled because each of these theories has both empirical support in opposition and then the citations, all right? I'm gonna just show you a couple of transitions and, and just some things that you can do. And I got this from the lit review from that economics piece. In contrast to, great transition, in addition to, okay? In con you know, all of these things, guide your reader. Oh, now I'm changing direction. Now I'm going the same direction. Now I'm drawing a conclusion. You need to pretend that your reader is not very bright. That's what my professor told me. He goes, you're really making a lot of assumptions about how bright your reader is. And I was like, well, I thought, I thought so. You know, no, make a roadmap. Make it explicit where you're going. Now I'm changing direction. Other authors claim that absolute and relative poverty have only conditional links to property crime. So I'm going through here. In contrast to these views or theories postulating a negative relationship between absolute or relative poverty and po property crime, yada, 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 and this is what everybody thinks. But other authors claim that they only have conditional links to property crime. And I'm proving that by citing the literature on that. I like this example because this debate looks at both content and method. And sometimes you will be looking at disagreeing with the content and the method of what, what's going on. This debate, the pointing word, right, is not settled because each of these theories has both empirical support and opposition. You saw that before. Even Cantor and Land's attempt to combine these opposing views, like, okay, there's support and opposition. Now there's a study done that tries to combine the support and the opposition but Hale and Saba criticized Cantor and Land's methodology in their study. That's getting down to the detail, isn't it? If you get this far down into the argument, you are almost ready to take your place in the conversation, correct? You know enough about it to know where the controversies are, what's been done, what's not been done, and now wh what your topic is going to be. Okay? Finally, the point of the lit review is to get to your dissertation topic or your thesis topic or your journal topic. You're justifying it. Okay? I've looked at everything. I know everything that's out there. I'm telling you everything that's out there. You're an educated reader. And you guys, I want to tell you something about your committee members. Your committee members know usually a lot about the topic, but they may not know everything about every theory that you've looked at and considered. So you need to be explicit about that. I knew that I had to be very, very explicit in my literature review because I was making the assumption that all my committee members knew everything about everything I was doing. They don't because you probably have an expertise because you've been spending so much time on that one tiny, tiny topic. It's very important to realize that, okay? So now you're gonna place yourself in the conversation your voice is going to be a part of the conversation, and then you're going to show how you built on all these ideas to justify your own topic. Okay, so we've talked a lot about what other people say. As you do your literature review, what do you say? Well, the theory works. The theory works. I like what you said. You said, well, they haven't been using uh, the right methodology, and that's why they haven't gotten to the root of the problem, so I'm justifying my study that way. Piece of cake. Easy. All right? 
How do I agree with this scholar about this topic, but with a difference? How do I degree, uh, disagree with this scholar? You guys, I'm using the term scholar, but really if you're in the sciences, more than likely you're going to talk about studies. I disagree with this study because they didn't look at this. I disagree with this study because they left out that variable. This methodology, this statistical, they didn't choose the right statistical method to analyze that data. But if we take the same data and we look at it a different way, it's going to yield better results. Is there, do you have something that you're going to have to give up? Is there a point you're going to have to give up? You know, there are some things where I'd said, well, I would love to do this, but that is not possible. So I'm doing this because it's as close as you're going to get to that. How do you justify a short study or whatever? And then how do I impart the ar importance of my argument? You should be passionate about what you're doing. The other thing you're going to want to do is draw conclusions. So, so you put yourself in the argument and then you draw conclusions. Say this is what I'm going to do. I've looked at all the literature. I know this, these are my parameters, my constraints, and this is what I'm going to do. This is another way to get yourself in there. Exposing the inadequacies of the current theory. The empirical literature on the impact of young population on crime rates is not as decisive as these theories would suggest. Gosh, you know, the conclusions are not that great. Maybe there's a new study out there waiting to happen. And then sometimes you have to just yank a gap in the research. Sometimes you find a gap in the research. Sometimes you just have to make a gap. This is how to make a gap. The theoretical literature does not consistently support a particular relationship between property crime and socioeconomic conditions. Limited by the particular theory and related variables chosen for analysis, the empirical literature often provides support to opposing theories. So what you're saying is the, liter the theoretical literature, there, there's not really consistency there, and the empirical literature also shows, has different results. So hmm, what am I going to do for my study? Maybe I'll come up with a new theory, or maybe I'll find a theory that hasn't been looked at and tie it to an empirical, you know, this is where you kind of think, you play with it, you play with it, you lay it out on the table and you go, what's not been done? What's not been done? And where are the holes? Okay. Sometimes you just find that things haven't been studied, and that's so awesome, okay? Not analyzed in cross-sectional and ignored in most time series studies, empirical evidence on an inflation effect is meager. Is meager. It's not out there. Ta-da! I have a dissertation topic, right? I have a journal article just waiting to be written because I've done all the literature review and I'm brilliant. Positioning your research. If you're doing a journal article, if you're doing a dissertation, if you're doing a thesis, what you're doing is you're exposing all the gaps and then you're going to put yourself right in that gap, right in the hole. Okay? Sweet spot. If contextual and situational issues play a significant role in determining the level of academic integrity in their classes, as McCabe asserts, and I've spent, in this particular piece, I spent several paragraphs proving that point. Okay? I didn't just make it up, you know. Then, faculty are an important part of the academic integrity equation. Research on faculty perspectives on cheating in general and plagiarism in particular are few and far between, and then I cite a bunch of people. Therefore, Right? I'm drawing a conclusion. I'm placing myself in the research. Nothing happening in the research on this topic, people. Therefore, it is the goal of my dissertation to focus on the insights, views, and perceptions of the faculty and often forgotten component of research studies on plagiarism. I just justified my topic, right? To gain greater insight into how faculty perceive pr issues of plagiarism in their classes and even more importantly, how they exist and teach, da da da. Now I've got my research questions as well in the second half of that sentence. We've looked at it a very macro way, but then we've gotten down and looked at the very, very fine details about how to write this thing. We spent a brief time talking, well, brief time talking about actually how to pull this off, but I'm not going to lie. It's a lot of work, you know, and you're going to find times when you get really frustrated. Um, and you're going to find times when you go, I'm so overwhelmed or underwhelmed because I can't find a darn thing on this, you know, that I just don't know how I'm going to, you know, move on. Um, just breathe. That's my advice. Just breathe and try not to tackle everything in one day. Say, I'm going to work on this topic today or I'm going to work on finding a source that will tell me 
I'm going to find that source that's going to tell me if my three month study is, is adequate. You know, or I'm going to tell I'm going to find a study that's going to help me find this. Or I'm going to put together all of the arguments like against this way of doing things. That's a good day's work, don't you think? That's a whole day's work right there. And if you do that, take the next step the next day or the next week, the next step in the next day. It's, it's daunting. And, and if you don't break down the task, it, 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 it tends to be um, uh, bl blocking. You get so overwhelmed with it that, you're, that you have, you're blocked. Um, back up, breathe. Use just some specific strategies from this and go one. I'm just going to do one thing. And I'm going to do one thing here. Now when you get to step nine or ten, you may go back to step one. I'm going to redo step one. But at least you've already gone that far. Okay, don't give up, you know. Thanks for coming. Sure appreciate it. Bye-bye.